Deuteronomy 19. While you're doing that, hey, I was looking at ahead to what we're preaching next week in Deuteronomy 20, and I'm kind of excited about next week. I got to get through this week, but I'm kind of excited about next week. It's about their war and how, how they have rules for war, but there's some nuggets in there, so you should look ahead. Deuteronomy chapter 19, if you're using Bibles on the chairs there around you, page 126. If the Bible that you're using from the chair has a flame, page 162, page 162. Deuteronomy chapter 19, we're just going to look at a few verses in Deuteronomy, but as we've done before, we're going to go look at some other places as well. Um, As as you're still turning there, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had someone falsely accuse you of anything? I figure that's an easy one. That's an easy one. Um, Had you ever thought about when someone falsely accused you of something, what does God think about that? Or does God have anything to say about falsely accusing people? He does, you bet he does, right? So as we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 19, which is as we're just working our way through, remember what Moses is doing as he's given this sermon to the people is here's what it looks like for you, a redeemed people, to live in the context of a relationship with a holy God in the land that I'm blessing you with when you're surrounded by all these other nations. They must reflect the character of the God who has redeemed them. The way God's people live out their lives reflects the God they serve or what they believe and understand about their God. Our lives, as we live them out, the things we say, the attitudes of our heart, the things we do, reflect what we actually believe about who our God is. Regardless of what we say, it reflects what we believe. Actions matter. Here's where we're going this morning. It's nothing profound or even rhymy. It's just what I've got. The righteousness of the people of God, and what I'm meaning there is the the righteousness of the community of faith, the, the purity of the community of faith that God gives to us in Christ. It is maintained, or it's upheld by maintaining righteous witnesses. So Moses is going to talk about the witnesses, and he's not going to just be simply talking about witnesses in the context of court cases, though that certainly comes up. But he's going to be talking about the, the, con, the context of relationships and any other category where one person might be a witness for or against another. The righteousness of the people of God is upheld by maintaining righteous witnesses. And we're going to see two things, broadly speaking, as we walk through here. Here's the first one. God is concerned about the integrity of a witness. God is concerned about the integrity. Now, a couple years ago, I came across a book by Townsend. Um, can't think of the first name at the moment, but the famous counseling guy, Townsend. Henry, I think. And uh, the book was called Integrity. And one of the things that he unpacked really well in that book, I'm not endorsing the whole book, just this part of it. Um, what he unpacked really well is this word integrity. See, when I ask you what the word integrity means, you're going to likely go to that, that quick answer we usually give, like, I, I do what... Uh, what's right even when nobody's looking, right? That's a good answer. But as he broke it down, especially with our English word, he said the, the, the word that's in there, the root, is the same word that we get for integer. And that goes back to elementary, middle school math, so I don't expect anybody to be thinking like that, but integer, a whole number. Wholeness. Integrity is about wholeness. Does it all line up? Is what's on the inside reflected on the outside? Is what's on the outside matching what's on the inside? Is is a person whole? And so he does a good job of unpacking that. So God is concerned, though, about the integrity of a witness. So look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15 is where we're starting. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Moses says this, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Remember, there's no centralized government. There is no ruler, no arche, no arche. Remember, I talked last week about the true meaning of anarchy is not chaos and disorder. It's just there's no ruler. What we're seeing here is God is the ruler of his people. He is the king. We call this a theocratic nation. We don't have that right now. But we had it then, and so the people are being directly ruled by God, and then under his rule, under his direction, under his Torah, his instruction, his law, then they lead according to their tribes, their family clans, elders, priests. They've got different, different levels of leadership. And so how do you maintain a sense of justice 
How do you pursue righteousness? Back in chapter 16, verse 20, I believe it is, was the refrain we looked at, righteousness, only righteousness should you pursue. And this is unpacking what does it look like to pursue righteousness? You might also remember, we call them the Ten Commandments. Remember, we talked through that uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 5, also found in Exodus chapter 20. And the two most popular spots, there's one other place. Um, but one of those words that God gave was, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Moses is unpacking that here. Moses is, is working his way through the things that he outlined earlier in the, this, uh, what we call the book of Deuteronomy, his sermons. He's now unpacking what does it look like to bear false witness. And so he makes this, this instruction. He says, when there's an accusation to be made, whether that is uh, for a crime that someone uh, uh, supposedly committed or a wrong that they have done, you can't take that based off one witness. Instead, you must have two or three. Part of this is to prevent personal vendettas, right? How do you prevent, if, if you go off of one witness, how do you prevent someone who you just got on the wrong side rising up and saying, I saw, I heard, he did. And then you're going to go and take the word of that one person who maybe you're not aware of it, but they've got a personal vendetta, right? So this is to guard against that kind of thing. And so only on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, you and I both know people are sinful, I can get two or three people together. I can. But the idea is this. It needs to be collaborated. It, it can't just stand on one because the integrity of a witness matters. The integrity of a witness matters. Now, this idea of two or three witnesses goes way beyond Deuteronomy. Part of the reason we're working our way through Deuteronomy, one, I just have a pattern of going New Testament, Old Testament, sometimes throwing some topical. Deuteronomy, though, is largely the foundation for the rest of your scripture. What's found in Deuteronomy, which is also then found in the first five books of the, the Bible, the Torah, is largely the foundation of the rest of the Bible. Here's how that works. As you get past Deuteronomy and you start to get in the book of Judges, and I'm mean, out Joshua and then Judges, and you start to get some history, you start to see the people of God living in the land and whether they obey or disobey what's been taught and instructed. You see prophets rise up calling the people back to the Torah, which they have violated. You don't understand these first five books. You don't understand the Bible. You don't have a good foundation for it. By the time you get to the New Testament, what you see happening is Jesus comes, and now he is explaining what does it look like to rightly live this out. What does it look like? What has it been pointing to? What does it look like? You've heard that said this. You've seen this. Your teachers say this, but here's what it is, right? He's helping to bring clarity, uh, and, and he's going to do it himself. All right? So the more you understand Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the better you're going to understand the rest of your scripture. It's going to unlock keys for you that you never, you might find it boring now, but if you keep reading your reading plans, you're going to start to go, oh, all of a sudden, two to three witnesses. I see that differently now. Here's why. Here we go. Two to three witnesses. Uh, I, actually, I guess I put that at the end. Hold on. We're going to get through Deuteronomy, and then I'll come back to two or three witnesses. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. This was a late night one. God is concerned about the motive of a witness. That's the other thing we're going to see, the motive. So the integrity matters and the witness's motive matters, okay? So as we go with Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19, let's keep going. We're going to look at verse 16 to the end of the chapter. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot foot. So the first thing he addresses is the integrity of a witness. You can't take a, an accusation based on just one witness. You need to have two or three. But then the motive of the witness matters. How do you maintain justice? How do you maintain righteousness? The motive matters. If you have someone who rises up to falsely accuse, then here's what the instruction. You go to the priest, you go to the judges, and you diligently look into the matter. 
You diligently look into both sides of the matter. Proverbs 18 addresses this. One person seems, this is good for relationships, by the way, any kind of relationship. One person seems right until you hear the other. Proverbs 18, somewhere in there. 18, 19, 20, maybe somewhere around, around there as verses. But it's Proverbs 18. One person seems right until you hear the other. There's two sides to everything, right? Both sides may be both wrong and the truth somewhere in the middle. One side may be right, one side may be wrong. But, but the idea is you've got to inquire, you got to diligently look into it, right? So that, that um, as they are diligently looking into it, if they then should determine, this is how you keep justice with, with no centralized looter, ruler, no, um, no, enforcing, uh, no law enforcement kind of structure. How do you maintain righteousness and justice? Well, here it is. This is how they did it on God's instruction. If you find out that the witness is malicious, he had false, uh, a malicious intent, he gives a false witness then whatever he wanted to see done to the person he accused, that needs to be done to him. You know where that plays out? In the book of Esther. With Haman. He builds the gallows. You should go read it. He builds the gallows for Mordecai. And the very gallows he built for Mordecai, once it became to, came to light that he was falsely accusing Mordecai, he got hanged on those gallows. That's how you keep justice in this kind of, kind of setting where there's no centralized government, there's no centralized law enforcement. You, you, you maintain righteousness, he says, by giving him what he wanted to see done to other. And in doing that, you shall purge the evil from your midst. In other words, you can't tolerate it. You can't tolerate a malicious witness among the people of God because that spreads, right? And when a malicious witness rises up, gets away with it, what does that then do to the people? It demoralizes the people. Well, those who knew he was a malicious witness, he got away with it. Nothing was done. That's demoralizing to a group of people, right? To the, wit to the witness who was false, it emboldens him in, in him or her's pride. I can get away. I didn't get caught, right? This is how we, these are the kinds of principles that we should be taking and then applying to our systems that we operate in, Right? Because when we start to remove penalties and justice and we let people get away with something or the punishment doesn't fit the crime, it just emboldens the person who's in rebellion, right? And so Moses is trying to give them this instruction so that they know how to handle it, but they need to purge it, he says. You need to get it out of your midst. When you've got a person who rises up and it becomes evident that they're making false accusations, and I guess I would add in there, and they don't repent, but if you're making a false accusation, you've already premeditated that. So repentance may be far in the back at this point. But if they don't repent, he's saying, you got to get them out of there. You cannot tolerate. It's like a cancer. It, it'll grow and it'll spread. You've got to purge the evil because the purity of the people of God matter. The unity of the people of God matter. How do you protect the unity of the people of God? You don't tolerate falsehood. So he goes on. you got to purge it. Verse 20 the result of you purging that evil from your midst is everyone else will hear it, and the result is they will fear. A good and right, healthy fear. Not a totalitarian type of fear, not a tyrant, but they will have a good, right, and healthy fear. God means what he says, and he will back up his word, always. And he shall never again commit any such evil among you. And then he gives this, this phrase at the end here, 21, your eyes shall not pity. Because again, what if it's a family member? You don't, you don't show partiality, you don't show favoritism, you don't pity them. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And this shows up, Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, I believe those are the two other places in the, in the Old Testament shows up. And then, of course, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 pulls on this. This is what we call commonly as the lex talionis. Lex talion. It, it, the idea is the punishment fits the crime. Now, you and I's tendency, because of the society we live in and how we're shaped, we read that and we think tit for tat. Like, you did this to me, I'm going to do this to you, which is exactly what Jesus came and explained that's not what it means in Matthew chapter 5. The idea was Moses was, by, by God's word, Moses was giving the people a limit so that they would not abuse justice, so that they would not pursue vengeance. Why? Because the the Lord says, vengeance is mine, right? And so this was the limit. The punishment must fit the crime. It must be proportional to that which has been done to the offense, that it must not go beyond. In other words, you don't have this in many of the other cultures around their day. If you go to any of the, the Arabic countries, what's the penalty for stealing? Right? Chop the hand off. 
punishment that fits the crime? I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's effective. But I, I, I think what God is doing, he's trying to get people here to be able to see that it's not about vengeance. It's not about getting back at someone. It's about justice must be served, but there's a limit to that justice. It must be proportional. And so he says, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Um, the life for life one may be literal in the case of murder, as we talked about last week. The only atonement for murder, there's no sacrifice for murder. The only atonement was the person who murdered must be put to death. Now, all these others, though, it's debatable as to whether he, it's meant literally or figuratively. There's a good case to be made that there might be monetary compensation tied to this. In other words, um, some people have said as they read this that the idea is, and, and in the culture this can be linked even in Scripture, there's a place in Exodus where I believe it's Exodus 21 verse 3, where um, based on how a person is injured, then they get compensated for the level of that injury. In other words, you, you, you hurt me, you harm me, you take my eye, then you need to give me compensation to compensate me for the damage and the losses that will come because I don't have an eye now. Or a hand, if I can no longer work, then the compensation might be higher because of that. Right? So there might be some, some compensation idea in here for this, but the idea is this is a limit. This is not about vengeance or restitution. This is about as you're pursuing justice, the punishment must fit the crime. All right, Exodus 23 goes in more detail about this very thing. Remember, Deuteronomy, a lot of stuff is summarized because it's an oral sermon, but it's been written down in other places. So here's Deuteronomy 23, verses one to three. Moses says this, you shall not spread a false report. He goes on, this is new to Exodus, it wasn't in Deuteronomy, you shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. So not only is a malicious witness to be purged, but you shouldn't join hands with that type of person. Verse two, you shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many. In other words, just because the crowd's going that, boy, we've seen that since 2020, haven't we? Before that too, but just been on display. Just because the majority is doing it doesn't mean you go with it, right? So even if the many are going, you don't side with the many and in doing so, dismiss justice, or as he says, so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. You don't show favoritism to one or the other. All right, that's Exodus. That two or three witnesses thing, it doesn't go away. It's a pretty serious thing for God, two or three witnesses. Here's Proverbs chapter 6, and a list of things that, that the Lord hates, because he does hate things. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are, that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, so pride, rebellion would go with that. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. We looked at that one last week. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. And then here's our relevant verse, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. The, the reason I keep talking about unity tied to this is this right here. We've talked about Hebrew parallelism before. We've talked about how in Hebrew parallelism, it's a very specific type of style of writing, especially when there's two lines. You can have three, but in two lines, these two lines relate to one another. They either say the same thing, they say the opposite, or that one's expanding on the other. It's further explaining. Okay, so when you see something like this, a false witness who breathes out lies, and then it's connected with, and one who sows discord among the brothers, the writer of Proverbs is linking these two specifically. Yes, he's linking all of these here, but he's linking these two specifically, and the idea would be this. One who witness, who's a false witness and breathes out lies, he sows discord. I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? You start making false accusations, you are going to cause division. That's that's obvious. The Lord hates that. Far be it from me to be on the side of the things that the Lord hates. Right? But there's two or three witnesses, this false witness. Let's keep going because it shows up more. Okay, now we get to the New Testament, and Jesus is interacting as he does uh, with crowds, with disciples, with uh, religious leaders of the day. Um, this one here in Matthew 15 is about why they don't wash hands, which was a tradition of the elders, not, not, a, not a law. 
And uh, the idea was you go and you ceremonially wash your hands um, before you eat. If you don't do that, then you're defiling that food. And Jesus is addressing that. He does it also, I believe it's Mark chapter 7. And his whole point there is, is that that's a tradition of the elders. And whether your hands are washed or not doesn't make the food clean or unclean. He says this, verse 18, though, but what comes out of your mouth proceeds from the heart. That's a good parenting verse. That's a good verse for marriage. It's a good verse for any kind of relationship. What proceeds from the heart, or what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Well, I didn't mean to say it. Well, you may not have mean to let it get out, but it came from the heart. You want to know what's in a person's heart, you listen to their words. It's as simple as that. You want to know what's in a person's heart, you listen to the other words. You want to know what's in your heart, pay attention to your words. We use this at our house, not, not in an inappropriate way, but in a, in a, a discipleship type of way. Uh, we know this is in your heart because we hear it coming out of your mouth. So Jesus says, that's what, that's what makes you unclean. What proceeds out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes, and look at this list, out of the heart comes things like evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, here's our relevant one in the list, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. See Jesus' concern here and how he views false witnesses. See, he's going back to something that's already been written, already been revealed. This is how God views this, okay? False testimony, malicious witness, it never goes away. Uh, look at Matthew 18, okay? If your brother sins against you, this is, all, this is also good for just relationships, it's good for counseling, this is conflict resolution, this is good for marriage, whatever. Any kind of relationship. If your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault. Don't go and tell someone else his fault. Go and tell him his fault. Don't go get someone else to help you tell him his fault yet. You go to that person first. If they sin against you, you go first. Tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Why? Because the goal is unity, right? The goal is unity. As soon as I start to escalate things and I bring more people that, that are getting involved, it's starting to escalate. But the goal is unity. Hey, maybe they didn't know. Maybe they didn't know that they offended you. Give them an opportunity to, to, to make that right. So I'm going to go to the person that's offended me. Okay. If he listens, you've won a brother. Great. Verse 16. But he, if he does not listen, take, here it is, one or two others. See, he's not making this stuff up. It's just part of God's word already revealed. This two or three witnesses is ingrained in who God is and how he operates. Oh, that just occurred to me. It's ingrained in who God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm. Okay, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence or two or three witnesses. Jesus is just continuing to teach what's already been taught. He's calling them back to it. I think I have, a, I have another one. Oh yeah, here it is. And then Paul, the Apostle Paul, who himself was a Pharisee, right? very well versed in the law and the instruction. He knew this when he was writing this. So earlier in the letter to Timothy, he's telling Timothy who's at Ephesus, hey, set up elders, set up deacons, right? Here's what, what you need to look for when you're setting up elders, when you're setting up deacons, the type of people you're looking for. Um, here's what it looks like in worship. Like he's given them instruction for when you're setting up this congregation, this assembly there. He gets to the end of the letter. He's talked about a widow and given some instruction about a widow. And he's talked about honoring the elder, especially the one who does double duty. He quotes another Old Testament passage about the ox um, being worthy. Um, don't muzzle the ox while it's threshing. And, and, um, and so then he says this, do not admit a charge against an elder. That would be the, the role, the office of, of that's uh, included in the leading of a congregation. Do not admit a charge against an elder except, here it is, on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Paul was thoroughly Hebrew. He was thoroughly Hebrew. He was marked by all that comes before the things he wrote, right? And so it was ingrained in him and he's living that out and he's giving people instruction based on that, right? This is why your Old Testament's relevant because it makes its way into the New Testament because the New Testament is built on it. So this idea of two or three witnesses, this idea of, of false witnesses, it's a big deal. 
And I said the righteousness of the people of God is upheld by maintaining righteous witnesses. You want to, you want to protect the purity of the people of God, whether that's a, a local congregation or a larger congregation. You want to protect the purity of the people of God. God's concerned about unity. Uh, Psalm, what is it, 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity or harmony, depending on your translation, right? Unity is a big deal. Why? Because when the people of God cannot be in unity, what does that reflect to the nations? What does that reflect to the people outside of here, outside of the covenant? What does that reflect? Well, why would I want to be a part of a people who say they worship this God, but then everything about them doesn't say that? Right? We're talking gossip. I know we don't have gossip here, but some people deal with gossip. Hello, we're talking slander. You know I was joking, right? We do have gossip here. Because we have people here, and wherever you have people, you have sin. Wherever you have people, you have sin. And wherever there are sinful people, they will operate in sinful ways. That's just the nature of it. We've got to deal with that. We've got to shepherd that. How do we do that? That's what Deuteronomy is helping us with this morning. We don't tolerate it. We don't tolerate gossip. Uh, we don't tolerate slander. We don't, we don't rise up and make a false accusation because I'm jealous or because I don't like you or because I want to see harm or whatever the motives are. God takes false witnesses seriously. In fact, so seriously, it's one of the 10 words, the 10 commandments. Right? It made the top 10. Okay? All right. The reason it's so important for the people of God to operate in unity is because God is unified. He's one God, three persons. He exists in perfect harmony, always has, always will. The way I live my life reflects what I believe and understand about God. And if my actions and my beliefs are not lining up, then Lord, help me. If my actions and my words are not lining up, then Lord, rebuke me. Right? Because I need to be corrected. I need to come in alignment with God's standards for the sake of unity. Now, Last thing I want to put before you as we're wrapping this up. This is a shorter one. You guys, be thankful this is a shorter one. Um, the Lex Telianus, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The idea that God says the punishment should fit the offense of the crime. I was thinking on this last night. One of the things I do when I'm, when I'm preaching, even in Deuteronomy, because everything points to Jesus right? He's on the road with the two disciples to Emmaus, Luke 24, and he starts with Moses and the prophets, and he tells them, shows them how all of that points to him, right? So as I'm studying, as I'm reading, even when I'm in Deuteronomy or Leviticus or Numbers, I'm saying, Lord, how does this point me to your Messiah? If God's standard is the punishment must fit the crime, when I consider the punishment, the judgment that God gives towards sin, my sin, your sin, when I consider the punishment, I have to know it fits the offense. And when I consider the judgment that Jesus, God in the flesh, comes, lives his perfectly obedient life, and then he willingly, as an innocent man, never once violating the law of God, never once doing anything that is worthy of hanging on a cross, he willingly goes and hangs on a cross. While on that cross, the Father pours out his wrath and his judgment on the Son. Amen. Not because Jesus the Son deserved it, but as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God, speaking of God, the Father, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. The judgment that God poured out on Jesus fit the offense because Romans 3.23, where are you at, Emmy? Are you in here? No, she's in the kids' church. Where are y'all at? Where's, where's Karis? Are, you're not in here either? Come on. Oh, there you are. The other day at the pool, they thought it was going to be fun to imitate their preacher and one of the things that they were doing in imitating their preacher was quoting some of these scriptures and Romans 3.23 came up. 
And so Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The offense is I have fallen short of the glory of God. The highest offense I can commit is to fall short of the glory of God. If I think there's another offense that's higher than that, I don't understand the glory of God, right? And so the punishment fits the crime, but what took place and the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of the gospel, here it is, ready? I don't get what I deserved. Jesus got what I deserved, and I get what he earned, and God's justice and his holiness and his grace and his love and his compassion and his mercy, right? We like to separate it and say, well, the God of the New Testament is not the God of the Old Testament. That's false. Run from that because all of that comes together in the gospel. The very same God who exercised justice in the Old Testament that offends us is the very same God who spared us from the wrath that we deserved in offending him and Jesus. He doesn't come for the healthy, he says. He came for the sick. God knows who he's picking. God knows who Jesus came to die for, and he did it anyway. Romans 5 eight. while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the question that we put before you then is, have you been spared from the wrath of God? If you have not trusted in Christ, you are currently under God's wrath and the judgment will fit the offense. But God, who is rich in mercy, makes us alive together with Christ. And we respond to what he did by faith. We receive it by faith. So Holy Spirit, come behind now. This is your word. Come and take and apply it to our lives. Give us understanding, illumine our minds to see and understand things that we've not maybe been able to see or understand, and help us to hear your voice through your word, and even now your voice as you're speaking to us about your word. There's things we need to confess or repent of because of being a false witness. God, lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. There's people we need to go back to and repent before, confess our sin against them to them, that we might be unified with a brother or sister, show us, that we might walk in the paths of righteousness. Father, if there's anyone here who is not spared from your wrath, but who is currently under it because they are not in Christ, show them. And Spirit of God, open their heart that they might respond to the gospel as you did for Lydia in Acts 16. Give them a clarity that they've not seen before, that they might trust in Christ and repent, turn away from what they're trusting in, and receive life. Here in just a minute, I'm going to dismiss us, but uh, if you're part of our prayer team, would you go ahead and um, grab one of those lanyards that's on the podiums back there on either side of the sound booth and go and put that on and go ahead and make your way up here. We're going to have people available for you that if you have prayer about anything um, we prayed about earlier, things maybe you want to confess to another person and get prayer for, prayer for healing because you have sicknesses or diseases, anything you want to know more about the gospel, uh, these are folks that are available. So if you're part of the prayer team, you can go ahead and make your way up here. And as soon as we dismiss, they'll be available for you. So now, Father, would you take your word and would you let it mark us? Would you make our hearts like fertile soil that the seed is planted and the roots go deep and it bears fruit, the type of fruit that comes with the Holy Spirit. And let that be seen in us so that those outside of here and outside of Christianity might be drawn not to us, not to a church, not to a congregation, not to a person in us, but to you as you are reflected in the way we live. Have your way with us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you guys next week.